Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mark Zakaria. This is Common Sense, and welcome back. We're today here in an interview kind of a forum with Carl Waddenston and Bill Feltner from Clean RI. Clean RI is a C3 that's an informational group that was organized in order to get uh, moving on um, uh, telling people about the importance of ethics reform and uh, and is primarily behind the, uh, I would say, could take credit for the uh, the recent passage of question two. Well, which I hate to do that. There's been so many people that have worked so hard. Honestly, Common Cause, uh, Operation Clean Government, League of Women Voters. All of whom are members of Clean RI. They are. So the coalition, as a group, has gotten together and reasserted the authority of the, of the Ethics Commission over legislators. Can you talk a little bit about how that uh, campaign evolved and what changes might have had to happen to get it done? Sure, sure. As I mentioned in the first segment, um, we were created because of that article and uh, where it was stated that there wasn't a lot of interest in ethics reform and we wanted to show that there was a great, wide, diverse interest in it. And so our mission was simply to educate the people on who supports it and why. And we would put out the information that, that, that they would supply, we would put out research information on why it was a good idea, etc. But <clears throat> once we knew we had a bill and that it had passed, Next job was to get it to pass on November 8th, which is actually in the past now as we're speaking. Um, so we could no longer be an education entity. We had to create a new entity that could legally say vote for this bill. And that is the creation of the Rhode Island Coalition for Ethics Reform. And the board members of the, that coalition are the founding uh, people that have worked on this for so long, Common Cause. Operation Clean Government, League of Women Voters, and Clean RI. Let me stop you just for one second. Sure. The, uh, the Rhode Island Coalition for Ethics Reform was presumably a C4, which is an advocacy group. Correct. You can take a stand and push that stand versus the C3 for Clean RI, exactly. which was essentially a research group, and here's some information, please read it. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Good. And, and so, and so that, uh, so we created that some months ago and went out and uh, found people to do PR for us, do polling for us, do everything that goes into a campaign. And again, uh, there's more experienced and knowledgeable people on that, so we went out and got them to do that. We are just the entity that uh, directs them. Well, uh, and uh, you know, every, uh, every uh, good intersection has to have a traffic cop. Yeah. So, so you, so you want to really think about if you go to the Clean RI website and, and Bill talked and about And Yes on Two, excuse me, Carl. The Yes on Two yeah. is for the, the new uh, um, entity that actually says vote on this, and that's yes on two ri.org. Right. And if you look at just all the groups on there, Mark, that it's a considerable amount of people that, the, that Bill and the team try to focus together and say, guys, we all have the same, same goal. We all have the same passion around this. And there are very few times in Rhode Island history that you can get that many groups around one issue. So it's such diverse Very, groups. very, exactly. very extremely diverse groups, but they understand the, the, the meaning of ethics because all those groups standing singular, singularly have strong values and ethics themselves right. for the people that want to follow them. And I would argue that coming together as a coalition, they also pooled their individual strengths in this area to make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. Absolutely, and the, the beauty of two of the way things are marketed today with the internet, um, if I send out something to people that are used to hearing from Carl or Lean Nation or Vibeco, they might listen, they might not, but if Carl sends it out, they listen and pay attention, and that was the reason of this coalition to say, look, we all want the same thing, so you say it to your members, you say it to your members, and that's how we got the word out, and that was really, the, the change the tide that began to sweep through the end of the legislative session. Again, if you remember at the beginning of the 2016 session, the Speaker Madiello would had nothing to do with this. And then, of course, we had the perfect storm of Gallus and Carnival, and all of a sudden this coalition pushing it behind, and then all of a sudden the Speaker is sponsoring the bill. May I suggest that not only did, uh, did Speaker Madiello have little to do with it, but it sounds like the traditional media the papers and TV stations had little to do with it too. Is this a primarily social media effort? Well, in the beginning it was, and I also saw that there were some groups that would not participate in the beginning until the speaker's support was there and the Senate president's support was there. And then, of course, 
and, and that's self-interest. I understand that. Many business groups, Carl is one of the very few that stood up against the tide in the beginning. Now everybody wants to join him, you know, because the speaker's behind the Senate president behind him, the governor's behind it, everybody's behind this bill now. Which, again, um, we're speaking in hindsight. Uh, we assume it's passed strongly, and so now the step is, what do we do with an active in, uh, ethics board? Well, it makes it makes sense, Bill, and and Rhode Islanders are re we're really Puritans here. <laughs> we're Stoics, and until we get good information, and I think that that's some of the cynicism that we have, and some of the stick in the mud that they talk about Rhode Islanders, is that we don't really have the good information. We haven't gotten a really good sense of it. But I think that with the articles that have been posted on that, the media, everybody working towards this is that we're starting to understand the strong, profound impact that this has. And then Rhode Islanders will get behind things. Rhode Islanders will stick behind yeah. things that they know, they understand, and they, and they, they get passionate about it. So. You know, and when you talk about an impact of something, we, we went back to, again, the, the focus of the Ethics Commission is to determine if there's conflicts of interest with legislators that are being paid, family members being paid, and, and they have a conflict between that and legislation that they're pushing. Um, we, we went back to look, when the Ethics Commission was in full power from 86 to 2009, there was an average of about 60 recusals per year. That means at 60 points in, in, in the, the session, a legislator said, I have a conflict of interest, I shouldn't vote on this. That number's dropped down to about 22. And in a small state, that's hard to believe. <laughs> that's really hard well, to believe. Well, knows everybody. And that's the point. Has there been a 60% reduction of conflicts of interest, or has there been a 60% reduction of people admitting they have a conflict of interest? We don't know the answer to that, but the point is something's changed. And when we get this Ethics Commission back in full force, as it, as it should be now. Those of us, if I may say, who are practiced in the patented Rhode Island eye roll, we think we know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. So, in other words, I think you've done a good job and, uh, and should be commended for it. So that brings up the question of what's next going forward now that we have that. I mean, we have an ethics commission. It now has uh, authority once again over the state legislature. Does it have any kind of a uh, process or procedure that it follows by which it measures legislative action? Well, it's always been there. Uh, again, the ethics commission didn't go away. It simply was... Restricted Silent. from doing its job for the actions of the floor, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and it's a very small piece, so they can still obviously, uh, you know, town officials, elected officials, etc. It's just what they do there. But the big difference is, is there have been legislators that have contacted the Ethics Commission to say, hey, do I have a conflict here? And they can't respond to them because they're just not allowed to. Now they can. So the first step would be to provide more information. And I know Carl's mentioned before of how the Ethics Commission has worked with the um, uh, Commerce, the Commerce yeah. Corp. Yeah. So it's important, this first step is to educate the legislators on what their responsibilities and, and, and rules are. After that, um, really what we found in the past was that when you had an active Ethics Commission, people became more aware, they became more involved, and you had more people feeling like, you know, the Ethics Commission provides two duties. Number one, it provides the people an ability to fix something they see as a problem, but it also protects legislators in a sense because it's a vetting process so that people aren't throwing bombs at them all the time. That's a resource that legislators can use. Yes, so sure, sure. So for frame of reference, I'm, I still sit on the Commerce Board, and I'd say that in the length of time that we've had when we go to session and we vote on, on different things, that we've had quite a few recusals, and I bet you we've had 22 recusals at least in the last few years just of that small group. Really? So okay. just as a sampling, I, I think it would get bigger outside. Yeah. Well, listen, with that, gentlemen, uh, we're having a great uh, discussion here, but we are up against the clock, so we'll take a break here. We'll ask the question again, are you kidding me? And then we'll be back with Carl Waddenston and Bill Feltner.